be great. And as we start the program, if you have questions for each speaker, you could also add them in the chat. Um, but we won't have time to go through them until the very end. Yeah, we have several helpers here today to help with the chat. And um. Give it one more minute and then we'll start. A lot of great things to cover today. Would it be okay for us to share a screen? Yeah, do you wanna share your own screen or who's asking? Uh, no, you can forward, this is Olga. Uh, you can forward the slide, but I might wanna show um, a couple of things online. Okay, yeah, let me know when you do it. I'll just take down mine. I, I don't think I have the capability to share screen. Oh, so, yeah. okay. Adele, can you? Yes, I'm gonna try to put Olga on, hold on. Oh, I just changed it. You got it? Yes, thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, you should be. Okay, hi everybody. Yeah, should we, should we start while people are coming in? Um, welcome to our COIL community webinar today. My name is Christina Lee. I um, work on the COIL coordinator at Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. And I'm playing the role of Hope Whitfield today because Hope was double booked and needed to be at a different conference. So um, if you can just put in the chat your name and your institution and your subject area, that would be great. And as you have questions, you can also include them in the chat. Um, we have many SUNY COIL coordinators on the call today who are helping with our webinar. Um, we have three speakers today who will talk about publishing uh, COIL research. And if you have questions for them, um, I think what we'll do is monitor the chat, but also have time at the very end um, for us to answer and talk about those questions, have some discussion. So our first speaker, oh, I have to do, I forgot. We have another poll that we would like for you to put in the chat. Um, could you uh, add in the chat if you have also published a COIL collaboration, where it was published, and what discipline was the focus of that paper? So if you can share that in the chat, that would be great. Okay, and you can also, there's a link here um, if you want to share it there as well. And our first speaker is Dr. Olga Asakalova from LaGuardia College, a CUNY, a CUNY school in New York. Um, Dr. Asakalova, uh, where are you? I can't find you on my screen. Olga is fine, Olga is fine. Oh, there you are. She is a professor of English and coordinator of the COIL program at LaGuardia Community College here in New York. Um, so why don't, you start and then I'll advance the slides, but let me know if you need me to take down my screen. Yeah, thank you so much, Christine. Uh, hi, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here again. I'd like to thank uh, Hope, Christine, and the whole wonderful CNE team for organizing this session. Um, I will be speaking um, in my capacity as the quill coordinator at LaGuardia Community College. Um, let me put in the chat a link to our website. This particular tab that I'm gonna share uh, contains some of the scholarship that was published by our faculty at LaGuardia at different times. Um, some of the um, articles are linked so you can take a look at them later. Uh, but I'll just uh, get started. Next slide, please. With uh, the very basic question, how to select a research path. These are some um, venues, some avenues, I should say, um, that our faculty have pursued when doing uh, research in COIL. One of them is international education. So if you are interested, for example, in exploring a COIL project uh, or projects that work well um, 
inside your university and you want to provide an internet uh, an institutional context for the coil program you may uh you know look at the scholarship on internationalization at home the a uh, one that's linked in my slide here uh, if you can hover Christine over that a little bit um, where it says internationalization at home, I guess it doesn't show, but this is an article that was published in the um, uh, Spanish journal uh, and it was published in both languages, in both English and Spanish by two of, uh, thank you so much two of the um, faculty members. One was a uh, LaGuardia faculty member, uh, Edward Goodman, he teaches business, and Martin Pantoja, um, who teaches at Guanajuato University. And so you can, you can take a look at this um, article if you'd like later. But yeah, this one really focuses on internationalization at home as a strategy, and they've looked at different um, assessments that they've done with their students and basically proved uh, in the course of their paper that this was an effective internationalization at home program. Um, another topic which I couldn't find any examples, but I think that in um, many conversations that we're having around COIL, people are always interested in learning about assessment. How did you, how do you do assessment? Do you do surveys? Do you do quantitative, qualitative? So if you have a model that worked well and you'd like to write about it, I'm sure that um, there will be uh, an audience for this and a venue for this. Another element is pedagogy or SOTO, and I think this is the most common one. Um, the example I'm providing here is a COIL program in a literature course, which was a part of a learning community, basically talking about within your discipline, how do you enrich pedagogy, right? Whether you're teaching literature or STEM or whatever else, um, how COIL is enriching that. And another, uh, another element here is COIL and intersections with COIL. So at this point, as everybody knows, I'm sure COIL is a thriving field. We do have a lot of scholarship. There are a lot of edited collections. There is a journal of virtual exchange, which I'll share later. So there is a niche for publications within the COIL or international virtual exchange field. Uh, there are also intersections with COIL, right? So you can look at COIL and culturally, culturally responsive pedagogy or COIL and diversity, equity, and inclusion, COIL and career readiness. So these are all uh, possible um, areas to look into. There is some scholarship done on all of them. Um, you may um, kind of, you know, see where there is a gap and how you can contribute. Thank you. Let's move on. Yeah, so now I'm just going to take a quick look at each of them. Uh, I think there's one more to go back. To go back, to go back. Sorry, am I going the wrong way? I can't. I think you're moving forward. Yeah, we need to go back. Uh, <laughs> okay. That was quick. Uh, sorry, let me, let me take this down for a second. Good to see everyone for a minute. Yeah, you can look at everyone's face for a second. Okay, yeah, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, topics within international education, you know, that whole internationalization at home uh, area. So some key terms and concepts, um, you can look at virtual mobility, virtual exchange, uh, you can look at internationalization at home as a curriculum oriented activities that help students develop international understanding, intercultural skills, and there is a um, the AACU, which stands for American Association of Colleges and Universities, and ha they have a bunch of global learning rubrics. So you can look at the language that's there and see how you can situate your research uh, within that area. And then of course there is internationalization abroad um, and you can take a look at what kind of stuff has been written about that as well. 
Okay, and for the pedagogy uh, or SOTO, some considerations, right, as I mentioned earlier, how COIL enhances the, the teaching of the disciplinary content. Uh, a very common methodology for this type of articles is doing a case study. And for that, you would need to collect student artifacts or student reflections, right? Usually people work with a lot of qualitative data. Um, and for that, you uh, most likely will need to secure an IRB or internet, uh, institutional review board approval, right? Because you will be dealing with human subjects. You may also interview faculty members um, unless you are one of the faculty and talk about, reflect about your own teaching, uh, your assignments, in which case you won't need an IRB for them. I don't think you do. Um, so opportunity to engage students as co-authors is also very exciting. I know that we have a presentation that's gonna talk about it today. Uh, and I know that within the field of international virtual exchange, student authored or student co-authored uh, papers are really welcomed, uh, both at the conferences and um, at, in the article that you wanna publish. Yeah, so here's just a little gist. I'm not going to go through it, but this was uh, one paper that was published by my colleagues uh, who collaborated with um, a school in Morocco, and they looked at a novel together, had wonderful discussions, and this was a learning community which basically contained several different courses. So there was French, uh, French literature in translation, uh, composition, another course, and these two, French Literature and Translation and Composition, uh, students looked, uh, participated in this project, right? And so they published this in a, a journal that was suggested by their Moroccan uh, partner who did not uh, make it into the publication, but he did recommend the venue. So one thing to keep in mind, I think, for COIL publications, you can publish in US-based journals, in international journals. You can also publish in international journals belonging to the country that you're working with. That's a good place to look. And as far as intersections with COIL, um, these are, you know, just some possible topics here, right? Program development, sustainability within across institutions. UN Sustainable Development Goal is a very, uh, or goals, is a very uh, popular curricular focus these days for COIL projects, right? Because they really speak to uh, global impact issues that are very important globally at the moment. And uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, you know, summarize 17 of those uh, issues and offer some resources. So it's very very exciting to explore them uh, in COIL. So that could be, uh, I know that some people have done this already. Um, you could easily publish an article about that because I know that we are all looking for models on new and sustainable development uh, curricula within COIL. Critical approaches, uh, if you are approaching your uh, COIL project, and looking at power relations between students uh, in different regions, right, between you and your partner, I recommend that you take a look at this really useful resource, criticalinternationalization.net. And this, uh, it provides a great bibliography that will help you uh, ground your work in this kind of, in critical perspectives, right, in, in, in critical approaches. If you wanna talk about employability, that's also very big right now um, in COIL. So if you wanna talk about how COIL intersects with career competencies, perhaps invite a career counselor from your campus to co-author with you. Um, if you're doing a COIL project where students or let's say going to an NGO virtually, you know, to international NGOs and kind of looking at how those organizations are uh, working both in terms of, you know, what they do, the, the, the content of their work, and also, you know, what kind of employment skills they're learning through these interactions. That could be a great topic. Uh, if you're designing tasks in a special way, that's always welcome. I think I mentioned assessment. Intercultural competence. Uh, Darla Deirdre, of course, is great. Uh, you can look at all the resources she has published. Regional implications. Sarah Goth has some work. So these are just some pointers if you do want to look at COIL topics or intersections with COIL.
And this is a little gist from that website that I was mentioning in the previous slide from a Critical Internationalization Studies Network, right? So again, this is a website that contains a lot of resources that speak to critical approaches, power relations within uh, virtual exchange. Um, if you are looking to see what is sort of trending now in the field, I recommend looking at IVEC conference. Um, this is their general website. You can look at past conferences, the kinds of topics, the kinds of tracks that the conference had, the themes of the conference. And then there is one coming up in 2022. In the fall of 22, you can take a look at the kinds of topics, the kinds of tracks uh, that are available and kind of engage with those topics. I would like to take a minute. Uh, this is a new um, organization that I happen to be a part of. It's called Coil Connect. The president is John Rubin, and um, it's essentially a partnership tool. Let me just take one second to show you how this uh, particular resource can be useful. Um, second. Okay. Share the screen. So this is really um, a good partnering tool. If you are a coordinator on your campus, you can go through the steps here to list your university uh, and basically partner, right? So uh, if you're listing a few courses here, then um, you will be contacted or you can contact other schools. So this is, you can go through it. I'm not gonna talk about it because it's not, the focus of this talk, right? Um, what I wanted to call your attention to is a couple of things. If you are interested in situating your research in the field of COIL or international virtual exchange, you may find this particular tab very useful. Um, every member, every institutional member who gets uh, into COIL Connect and lists their school, their courses, they are asked to um, fill out a few surveys, right? Uh, so the data is then aggregated here, right? It's anon anonymized, uh, but it's all here. So if you want to kind of see what's going on in the field, you know, how many institutions are doing COIL uh, in 2020, like, like, for example, if you want to look at the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic on the field, right? You have some data here that you are very welcome to use, right? If you want to look at uh, COIL leadership, institutional structures that are available. You can take a look at, you know, what's going on here. It's all, um, you know, uh, life. You can take a look at all these categories. Uh, what kinds of challenges people are using, right? Uh, in order to, I guess, in order to view all of them, you have to register, but that's, that's you just register. You can register as an institutional member, um, in which case you would have to be the coordinator, or you can just register as a general user if you're just a faculty member um, and you know have access to all this information. Another thing here is a list of organizations that we are going to have here. So all the organizations within the field of virtual exchange, well, not all of them, but many of them will be listed here. And again, it's a good way to understand what's going on in the field and what and if, if that's the kind of research you're interested in. And finally, uh, there is the COIL guidebook that John and Sarah Goth uh, have written with a lot of contributors and this is some of the sections of this book will be available here on coil connect and some of them will not but um it is also uh kind of an upcoming thing that you may look into all right i think i'm almost done So again, the link is in the slides and the slides will be made available to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just a quick note on terminology. I think everybody knows that international virtual exchange is now the widely recognized uh, term that's associated with IVAC. But of course, th these are just some keywords when you're doing research, you may try all these different things, right? Because COIL goes by different names depending on uh, the field, like for example, in the foreign language field, uh, people use telecollaboration as their term, right? So when you're doing your research, try all these different uh, keywords. 
And these are just a few theoretical and conceptual frameworks, right? So experiential learning, you may, you may wanna to contribute to a volume or a journal dealing with that. Learning communities, because of course, COIL is a type of learning community. Uh, global STEM, culturally relevant pedagogies, global Englishes, especially if you're looking at how, you know, power relations, uh, multilingualism with COIL, how to navigate language challenges in COIL, those can all go under global Englishes. Post-colonialism, uh, OER, digital humanities, critical digital literacy, these are all helpful frameworks. And here, I just wanted to note a few publication venues. There are a lot more, of course, but if there is a journal of virtual exchange, and I know you can even submit uh, a special issue idea and have a number of faculty members uh, contribute with you. There is intercultural communication education journal. Um, and then here, the last bullet point, additional venues and guidance. This is just a uh, handout with some venues, some uh, additional guidance that I hope you'll find useful that we put together at LaGuardia. So you can, uh, you can check that out as well. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Olga. And then our next speaker is Dr. Anissa Vahed. Um, okay. And, Dr. Vahed is a dental technology academic researcher and practitioner in the dental studies department at the Durban University of Technology in South Africa. And she has a long bio here that, if, um, that you can read and we'll move on to her slides. Thanks, Christina. I'm going to switch off my video. It's scary looking at my own face. I'm gonna switch it off for now. Um, Good morning and good evening, everybody, depending on which part of the globe you are from. Um, I'd like to thank Hope and the SUNY COIL team for inviting me to share some of my experiences of researching COIL and recognizing that it nurtures a, a concept or a new area, not a new area, but an area that I'm currently working with is undergraduate research, scholarship, and creative inquiry. So I'm going to have a, a slightly different slant to, um, uh, to the coils, uh, to the type of work that I'm doing with coil. Uh, and before I do that, I'm, Christina, can you go to the next slide for me? Do you see the next slide? Yes, I do. I wonder why it's so slow, because the PowerPoint was far quicker. But nonetheless, let me move on. So a bit of a background on some of my projects. And um, to use Ron Boschmer's description, um, irrespective of my international partners and I being cognitively distant um, in our respective areas of expertise, uh, we had the resilience to work together to achieve proximity. Uh, particularly in achieving some of the learning objectives, not some, in fact, all of our learning objectives for our virtual exchange projects and making sure that learning was driving the students' performance. So this slide gives you an overview of some of the projects that I've completed since starting COIL uh, at the Durban University of Technology in 2016. In fact, in 2016, uh, DUT was the first um, South African University to embrace COIL. And I was very fortunate to have taken the opportunity. Yet at that time, I don't know why I had, uh, because of um, I didn't see synergies with the type of work I was doing. And I'm glad I did it because um, at the COIL Center had definitely changed my perspective. So these projects, um, I've worked with the United, I worked with partners from the United States. I had the absolute pleasure to work with uh, Christina's colleague at MCC, Professor Krista Rodriguez, and she comes from a dental um, therapy background. So she's very clinical driven, whereas I'm a laboratory based technician. And then I had the um, pleasure to also work with um, my partner from Nassau Community College, um, as well. And then uh, my Brazilian partner, Professor Fabio de Souza from the Federal University of Pernambuco. Uh, it is unfortunate none of them could make it here, uh, but I, I have to tell you that this would not have been possible without the, like I said, the resilience and the determination to ensure that we received the, uh, that we achieved our objectives. 
So our projects basically were responding to some of the key areas that are critical in, in the field. Um, for example, green dentistry very much responds to um, the sustainable development goals. And so in 2019, um, we had a tri-partnership between Brazil, United States and South Africa, and that turned out to be quite an interesting partnership. And in 2020, it was just Brazil and South Africa. Um, I'd like to touch into the 2019 and 2018 talking about the four P's. And I also partnered with, um, as you know, COIL uh, allows you to partner with anybody, anybody from any discipline. And I managed to partner with Professor Levine, who taught me about the four P's of marketing, which was quite an interesting perspective. Um, given that my students were developing prototypes in how to save materials in the laboratory. And in order to save these materials in the laboratory, they needed to understand how to prepare a proposal, a business proposal. So as dental technicians, we, they had the knowledge of developing the prototype, but not necessarily the knowledge of developing a business proposal in terms of the marketing of that prototype. And that was quite an intensive session that required the students to think outside the box to kind of navigate an unfamiliar territory, which is business administration and finance. And that required a, a, a high amount of work from both the Nassau side, as well as the Durban University uh, of Technology. And, and that was an area which I thought, hmm, this is intriguing because the type of work that my students were doing were very much related to what we recognize internationally as high impact practices because they're using inquiry based practices to navigate an area that they're unfamiliar with. So I was beginning in that time to make these connections. So yes, COI is an internationalization of the curriculum. Uh, and as Dr. Olga has so eloquently uh, uh, presented that you can, uh, you can, it fits in many areas of work such as pedagogy, um, scholarship of teaching and learning. And I was very keen on, on learning about COI and as a reflective practitioner in my curriculum. And I think something that academics really struggle with, and I, and, and, and I say that very generally, so forgive me, is that this whole idea of how does one understand how a project like COIL, which is responding to key global networking and um, uh, missions, how does, how does one bring it out into a curriculum? And, how do, and that's what SUNY COIL tries to do, is to kind of teach you how to integrate it. So that was a niche area that I recognized back in 2018 and 2019, not realizing that I was actually kind of um, going to go into the area of undergraduate research. Then I also continued with the work on infection control. Um, yes, that can move on. And that was uh, with Krista and again with Fabio. Uh, infection control was interesting because they had different perspectives of clinical and laboratory. And what Having worked with these projects in the last, um, for, uh, uh, for reasons for 2021, which you'll learn soon. Yes, thank you, Christina. This is the page that I want. This is a slide that I want. Oops. Uh, forwards, Christina, one, one slide forward, please. Um, thank you. Um, so what I realized is that the projects that we were doing uh, and early in my career, uh, early in my career then, is that we all at some point um, experience this, we inevitably experience this in a higher education institution, is that at various stages of our careers, each of us experience the pressure to not only conduct research, but to also to publish our findings in order to stay relevant and be successful within the academic community. If we don't, we face the risk of not being promoted or moving progressively within our respective fields. And this is very much a publish and perish uh, issue that exists in all universities and mine uh, is no different. So when I started COIL, one of the strongest advice I would also um, uh, give is that start thinking about how would you do a proposal for an independent study with the new universities? It's fortunate with, with Dr. Olga and the other speakers, you'll have units of internet, you'll have inter, um, international offices and within the international offices or a separate from international office units that can help you promote your research work. In South Africa, um, it, it's also very challenging um, uh, in the sense that we can't just publish in any journal in order to receive a subsidy and recognition for research, uh, for research outputs. We have to write in one of the journals that have been commissioned by the Department of Higher Education and Training. And therefore we have to select those journals. 
it is quite um, uncomfortable to tell a colleague, sorry, I can't write in your journal because it's not part of the DHED, so Department of Higher Education and Training. But that's the only way we as South Africans, uh, South African researchers um, can, can actually escalate the academic ladder. Don't move forward yet, Rosina. <laughs> sorry, can you just go back to that slide? So, so yeah, I'm just gonna tell you, I'll tell you when to move forward. <laughs> um, so the other challenge that I also was confronted with as laboratory-based technicians, um, my industry is not familiar with research. They don't care about research, in fact. They want to know whether the plies that I make fits in the mouth. So research is not a norm in dental, in my primary field of dental technology. And I realized that early in my journey of FOIL. Uh, and then I realized that, you know, seeing that I was one of the first to have ventured into COIL, which is an unfamiliar territory back then, uh, becoming more familiar, but also leading to many other avenues. It's a really rich resource to reflect uh, on one's own practice. And that's what I set out to do. How do we become uh, reflective practitioners by doing the research? This was to my horror of my partner, Professor Rodriguez, who hated the word research because of her limited experiences in publishing papers. She, however, had a wealth of knowledge and experience in diversity and culture and improved reading. So uh, we had a fort we had a very, um, 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 our differences, maybe I may say that, but our difference became our strengths in writing the papers. And, um, and so we reflected by me writing uh, the, the, the core content and Krista would then critique in terms of her social science background related to culture and diversity. So, you know, my other advice in, in, in venturing out writing research is your partners may not have done research and it's quite okay. And if there's one partner who has, then still venture into it, still write and, and see how you can change that because there's always research in whatever you do with regards to COIL. But I wish early in the day when I had introduced the concept of writing for a paper that I shared this with Krista. And this is a tool that I found is quite useful, not just for students that I teach, but for my COIL partners who are unfamiliar with writing research papers. Uh, very useful tool. It's a think, check, submit tool. Um, and so if you have any reservations on where to begin, whether you where to start for a journal paper, where to start for a publish, um, for a chapter or a conference paper, I would recommend uh, seeking, uh, I would recommend just reading this and it will give you some sort of initial um, um, ideas on how to set and how to select your journals. Christina, you may move on to the next slide, thanks. So the next two slides um, are basically some of the papers that I have published. Uh, and that yet again is through the good fortune of having wonderful partners who uh, are resilient. Um, so along with writing, uh, with, along with conducting our COIL classes, um, I had also applied for a um, ethics clearance to conduct research in COIL. Yes, I had to do several independent projects. And so my one advice would, would, would be is that if you see this project expand, uh, extending longitudinally, you should be applying for one major project as opposed to several, several short projects through your university for ethical clearance. Ethics is huge uh, in every institution, but I think it's what, what sets us apart in some institutions, can, it can be really challenging. It goes to an ethical review board, which don't necessarily understand the social aspects of the social theories, if especially a very science-driven um, ethical board. Um, so uh, the, the first papers, as you can see, is with my colleagues from Brazil and the States, and it's, um, it's in press at this moment, it's a book chapter. The second one was written on my own, um, <laughs> because my colleague um, in, in Nassau thought, no, um, this is where he's going to, he's not going to contribute, and that's quite okay, because he contributed in, in, in a journal paper. Christina, next slide. Um, and so these papers are available online. I think some of them are also in open access. So um, should you want to read these papers and should you um, um, can't access it, please reach out to me and I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy to share my papers uh, with you. And these are other papers. You can see most of my papers are very reflective of the students' experiences with how they engaged, what constrained the, ex what constrained the experience, what enabled it. Also, I did an, we did an author ethnographic account of what we thought about COIL, uh, given that we had uh, various expertise and skills 
and how did we come together despite of that? And that's, I think that's the marvel of COIL is that irrespective of our differences, we can still find commonalities and still pursue a, a research area. Next slide, Christina. Uh, it was interesting to hear uh, the, the previous speaker uh, present uh, multiple aspects of, uh, of how you can approach research in, in terms of pedagogy and scholarship, and also sharing some wonderful resources in terms of a theoretical framework. Uh, I would like to advise um, that if you have the opportunity to please, uh, these are two theoretical frameworks, which I wish I had known about this in my, one of my very, my, my, in fact, in my first two years of COIL, if somebody told me about these uh, social theories. Uh, understanding I come from an applied science background, social theory is really not my uh, area of work because um, although I do do it, um, so I'm not familiar with many social theories and I had to read about this. And I would recommend that please to kind of read about proximity, distant proximity dynamic theory. It is very much uh, relevant to how students experience this in the classroom, particularly from the perspective of uh, geographic location, social, cultural, cognitive, institutional and organizational considerations. And along with that, is to also look at Hofstede's cultural dimensions framework, which supports the importance of including a strong cultural component and focus within your core project and how to choose the relevant technology to engage students meaningfully. Um, so my advice would be is um, to look at these theories by these authors. It really is a useful conceptual structural tool in venturing into understanding um, your students' experiences. Next slide, Christina. And so how did it lead to, how did Fulbright come in here? So um, I, I also, um, last year I was a research, a Fulbright scholar at Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. Um, although I have a dental background, <laughs> Emory Riddle does not uh, support any of the health sciences field except for STEM and uh, aeronautical sciences and engineering. Uh, my project was to advance the undergraduate research teaching nexus. And in, in, in understanding the work of undergraduate research excellence, which the United States is far ahead in comparison to other countries uh, and highly commendable, I realized that through the journey of being a Fulbright and Embry, the COIL is definitely allows this inclusion of uh, COIL, uh, allowing uh, um, the inclusion of international virtual exchanges into the curriculum is certainly a very nuanced way of promoting undergraduate research excellence and how students can think creatively. Also COIL helps, as you know, it facilitates students' awareness of the interdisciplinary nature of learning through integrated case study projects that we talk about in our research. So I, Christina, if you can just uh, click on button so it can show the name. So my current work is currently concentrating on uh, um, my projects that I've done in the last uh, four years and to demonstrate how it uh, COIL is a, an example of an innovative curriculum, uh, particularly in the teaching, uh, particularly in serving as a teaching and learning model for undergraduate research and creative in inquiry. And therefore my uh, upcoming paper, uh, Christina, if you can just click, focuses on a comparative analysis of students' opinions on COIL cultivating research or inquiry-based learning and creativity. Um, I mean, e-posters, uh, uh, doing an e-poster is a high impact practice. It's inquiry-based practices. And so I'm, I'm trying to now look at all the data uh, for the last uh, four years over the six, over the seven projects. And I'm trying to do a longitudinal analysis quantitatively, as well as then qualitatively compare the responses and see how this, um, this fits. And this links to a bigger project within my university. Uh, Christina, if you click, uh, and it's called Supporting Undergraduate Research Excellence, which I'm currently co-managing and leading with the DBC of uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research Innovation and Engagement. And what I'm intend doing, next slide, Christina, is along with the COIL theories uh, and um, theoretical frameworks and conceptual frameworks, I'm gonna use um, some of the high impact uh, uh, undergraduate research frameworks, such as the one before you by Healy, to use as an analytical tool to kind of demonstrate how COIL um, connects with this. 
So this is where I'm currently am. And my, my message is that, yes, COIL does speak to internationalization at home, speaks to internationalization of the curriculum, speaks to the scholarship of uh, teaching and learning, speaks to pedagogical intervention. And here's another new, no, a new area. It speaks to curriculum mapping, curriculum integration, linked to undergraduate research excellence, scholarship, and creative inquiry. Um, so it opens many other doors of opportunities. It's just finding those opportunities. So good luck, everyone. And I encourage you to pursue the research. Um, should you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to uh, share whatever information I do have. And with that, thank you for listening. OK, thank you so much, Anissa. Now we have. Um, Dr. Maria Cristina Montoya, and yes. she is an associate professor at SUNY um, oh, yeah. Indiana. Her expertise in sociolinguistics allows her to implement innovative teaching practices targeting intercultural competence. Um, Dr. Montoya designs COIL modules while developing new partnerships with universities in Colombia. And I will let you get started. Um, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, I had been engaged with COIL since 2014, and my COIL experience had gone in many directions, and I see it as an evolution, as a process of maturity in my pedagogical approaches, and also a great support for my institution. So my institution has been going up and down. Some years we have a lot of interest in COIL and a lot of uh, professors engage and other times we don't. Uh, and pandemic really put us in a standby. So um, let me tell you, I haven't published uh, my COIL work yet. There's uh, a paper that I wrote with my one of my partners in Colombia and it's currently under review at the American Council of the Teaching of Foreign Languages. I believe that what I do in COIL is basically a pedagogical enhancement approach to teaching foreign languages and culture, in my case as a, as a professor. And I, I see that it's not only one project or one semester, but an evolution of many project, projects and how I improve it every semester. So in, my, in the paper that is currently under review, I analyze a data that I collected from my students about expectations with COIL outcomes uh, from the COIL experience. And I first intended to publish it in a intercultural journal. Uh, and I think I chose the wrong journal for, and this happens when you're trying to publish because I, I wanted to show the intercultural theory background that I was uh, trying to come across with the paper. But the, the way I collect data for this first six years, um, since I counted since 2016 until two thousand four years until 2020, uh, was not uh, the, uh, the was not exactly what this kind of journal um, intends in their articles to publish. So so they gave me feedback, important feedback, and told me maybe this paper would work better for a pedagogical journal. And that's what I'm doing with ACTFL. I look particularly in ACTFL because that's the organization, the National Organization for Foreign Languages in the United States. And I feel like I haven't seen much of a COIL um, theme in, in these journals. So I see my work in COIL, I have done several presentations and proposals for grants. And I have um, COIL base, I have gotten a Fulbright Scholar Grant, grant with Univalle in Colombia, Universidad del Valle. And just this year, I got the Fulbright Specialist to go back to Colombia and disseminate COIL, um, do COIL academies, uh, train people into it, recruit um, faculty into conducting COIL. So I see the COIL um, more than the approach in the classroom. I, I see that the five C's that we promote in foreign languages, the communication, communities, cultures, comparisons, and connections are all part of a COIL process. So that's my, my base framework for COIL. And 
I cannot do this alone. I'm just a faculty in the classroom, but I need uh, support from the instructional designer in my campus. I need academic affairs support and the global office support. Um, so where I am right now is that I, I call myself a matchmaker, a coil matchmaker, and that's what I became. So we can move to the other slide. Um, so the stages in my own experience in COIL, the first, when I just got into COIL in 2014, I felt that I, I knew what it was, I was trained, but I needed to experience it, connect, discover exactly how it worked for me and for my discipline. Um, in the second part, I collected data. I started collecting data in 2018 to 2020, quantitative data. And I kept all the reflections that I asked my students at the end for qualitative data. Um, and then after I collected that data, I, I already wrote an article that is under review, uh, but I saw that I needed to expand the team of researchers. I needed to involve the students into this. Um, so my first intention with a student leader, I sent, um, I applied with the student for a traditional uh, track grant internally in my institution. And she went to Columbia to collect data. Um, and that is part of the, of the article that I just, um, that is under review. Uh, but then after all this um, looking how I can expand, I, I thought, well, maybe what I need to do is become a matchmaker and recruit people and convince people that COIL is a solution uh, for, world, for world problems, for pedagogical approaches. And in that effort to become a matchmaker, I, in a trainer for COIL, I, we have done uh, several uh, COIL academies. We did two in Colombia. And right now, one of my colleagues from India, um, with my support and, and talking about how COIL, she can implement COIL with India, then she proposed a Fulbright and she got a Fulbright also based in COIL and went to India. And we just finished a COIL Academy with India that hopefully um, the partners that we uh, help create um, become uh, permanent and, and they disseminate COIL. Uh, so at this moment I am um, researching and I have done several IRBs for my initial research, for my students' research and for now the institution. I am researching the um, COIL practitioners in, on my campus and see why did they continue, why they were interested, why they couldn't continue, and gathering all this data to present to my campus administrators and said, what is that we need to support? So we can go to the next slide. Um, this is just a background of how I started. I connected to several institutions in Colombia and I did COIL pair up with faculty leds. Uh, I conducted five faculty leds with trips to Colombia. It was exhausting. Faculty leds are one shot and then you, you feel exhausted. Um, but COIL really enhanced these faculty leds. I could write a whole paper about this. Uh, but I, I felt like I needed to move on from this and, and uh, disseminate the idea that COIL is more attainable, that we could internationalize the curriculum with virtual mobility easier than if we try just to do physical mobility for all our students. Um, so I started with Columbia in 2014 and uh, this slide just reveals up to when I got the Fulbright Scholar, all this experience was my base to uh, write the grant for the Fulbright. And we can continue. Um, so as I was exploring COIL, I realized that COIL is more than teaching, it's a scholarship and it's service. COIL had led me to connect to a specific community in Colombia 
where now we service. Um, I also have a program where students um, connect to people once a week in Colombia to teach them English. And this is a result of COIL. So uh, COIL could have many directions depending on whoever wants to apply it and however they want to do it. And this is what I have been discovering as I implement COIL every semester. During pandemic, I continue implementing COIL. I never stopped. And Colombia suffers some national strikes in, for higher education. And even though my partner and I uh, continue conducting COIL the best we could. We can go to the next slide. So this is the mission of my first Fulbright 2018-2019. I went to Colombia. We conducted a COIL Academy um, over there. Um, I hosted about 10 people from Oneonta in Cali while I was there, and they pair up with, um, with other faculty. However, right after we did this COIL, the um, higher education institutions in Colombia public went on a strike. And that really stopped us, our COIL partnerships with the public institutions. The private kept going. And we have some people that are permanent and they continue doing COIL. It was a wonderful experience. I was able to teach new technologies into foreign language education. And at that point, I wrote also an article to tell about my experience with that course. But as the pandemic came, Stop the publication, and now I don't know exactly where it is. I have the paper, but I don't know exactly where it is. So that's something that I need to dig into. I, I felt like the pandemic really put in a standby a lot of this writing and publishing processes. We can go to the next one. Um, the role of foreign languages department. This is all of us when I went to Cali to do the, the Fulbright and conducted the COIL Academy. And the foreign languages departments, I see that we are bridges. We can build bridges with all the disciplines. Whenever you have disciplines with different languages and, and they cannot connect, we are have been trying with Univalle to do trios where there is uh, two people from different disciplines that they can speak English to each other, the faculty, but not the students. So we have a third, a group that um, comes from foreign languages and they support the students in English. And uh, that way the foreign languages can, can bridge on the, on the linguistic component. Um, we also in Univalle and also in Onionta, we are the matchmakers of the institution. We are the people who recruit and who tell everyone how COIL could be a intercultural avenue for internationalizing our curriculum. So foreign languages departments, I think, should be key in the process of institutionalizing COIL. We can go ahead. Um, and this is basically through all my practices, what I discovered that happened in COIL. And I was told that this happened in COIL when I was in the training, but I didn't see it that clearly until I conducted several times. So I know, and I, um, in my research, I found an article uh, of a, a author that explained how his ESL classes were um, doing virtual exchange and they had these type of talks, social talk, planning talk, language talk, uh, or the metacognitive talk. And I discovered that this is the structure of COIL. Uh, or maybe I was told, but I didn't see it this way. So I started with this structure, and this is what I base when I match make uh, my colleagues, when I um, conduct the COIL academies. So I, I work in multiple directions, and this is how I show them that the structure of COIL could work in any discipline. We can go ahead. So this, these are some examples of this year coiling. Uh, I have a, another partner. So what I'm doing right now is I'm coiling with all my classes. I keep my permanent partners, but I always add a new partner and they do coil with me to get trained. And then I pass that partner to someone else. So I am a trainer of new people and then they experience it with me. 
and then they go to someone else with the hope that they find a permanent partner. And uh, this is about the neighborhoods. Um, I just found a partner that is very enthusiastic about um, the topic of showing a space, uh, biogeographies, what does it mean for people to grow up in certain places and compare those places. So we're doing modules with the idea of the geobiography. We can go ahead to another example. So this is another example that I did this year. So it's our neighborhoods uh, synchronously, asynchronously. So they talk, uh, students talk on uh, with each other synchronously, and then they post pictures and talk about it in voice thread. Voice thread is what I use uh, to conduct my coils. So this is the new data that I'm collecting. Um, and I feel like with coil, I, I can collect quantitative data, but the quantitative data doesn't really, so far hasn't really tell me results, concrete results that I can come to a conclusion and generalization. But the qualitative data really tells me how it works and what is improving in the student's intercultural competency. We can go ahead. Uh, this is another example of what I do with the voice thread uh, and everything that they have to report back in their um, in, in their interaction, the students is oral. I usually do it oral because I teach uh, mostly conversation classes. We can go ahead. Um, my framework, as the previous speaker was talking about frameworks, I try to focus, and this is what I did my research mostly, in intercultural competence. What is interculturalism? And how does the students acquire intercultural competence leading to intercultural maturity. And I found several authors um, that talk about intercultural competence, not necessarily related to COIL. So my task in my research is try to relate intercultural competence leading to maturity and what COIL does for this uh, process. Let's continue. Um, in the process, I in all you coilers know that the the part that we don't like about coil is um, going after students if they connect, if they answer, if they don't answer, monitoring all that part. So I decided, well, let me involve the students and ask them to take care of those logistics, pairing them up. Um, monitoring if they're doing the work, highlighting things for me whenever they observe something. So I have been involving um, TAs and COIL coordinators uh, since the pandemic. I, I believe I started that or maybe a little bit before, but because of the strikes, um, they work um, the entire semester with me. The campus at Oneonta has supported me in a way that they pay a fellowship for them or they, um, or my chair accepts that they become my TAs um, in a COIL course. So I count on their help. And now I don't need to worry about the logistics because they take care of all of that. We can continue. Um, and this is really the, the role of the teaching assistant. They're bridging, they're bridging between the two campuses. The two so I had to go in, I had to go in for my, uh... Maria Christine. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I know I was muted. Um, so because I involved these TAs, these students, undergraduate students became so involved into COIL, they wanted to find out more about these other institutions that we decided that we could apply for a traditional track in campus and have them go to Columbia and research for them and for me. So right now, uh, currently, as we speak, they are in Colombia, these three students, they were last week in Cali and they met the candidate for vice presidency for the first time. Um, the left wing um, is, is really popular in Colombia right now because people are tired of corruption and what's going on. So they met this candidate in, in their hotel and, and they got so excited, talked to the person um, and they also visited Univaja, now they're in Ucaldas, 
and they will end up their research in Uni Cartagena, the three institutions that we had been coiling with, and they have been my TAs previously. Now they went with, they did IRB, they went through the whole process of becoming researchers, and they're really empowered. They're there and they really think that they are researchers and that they are going to bring important information for us. We can go ahead and I will tell you that story later uh, when they come back. So, so I just wanna say that it's almost one o'clock. Yes, and I'm done. This is my last uh, slide. And this last stage that I am right now is I, as I went through COIL, and my college became very interested in the sustainable development goals because that's like a common language to talk about sustainability. So now I, I am purposely designing my COIL modules to integrate sustainable development goals. And I'm also in the COIL academies that we do in the matchmaking, I'm also involved in the sustainable development goals. I think that's the next step. And for future writing, I will have to consider sustainability framework and COIL together. And that will be my next topic. So this is where I am right now and I'm done. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you everybody. We ran out of time to ask questions. I don't know, Hope is back. So I don't know what Hope wants to do in terms of. Uh, I think if, if anybody wants to stay and ask some questions, that's fine. And then also know our, um, our webinar is not going to run in July, but it will be in August, and we're going to focus on um, ways in which you can create equity and inclusion in your classroom activities. Um, we'll have a presenter from University of Padova, who's originally from Indonesia, um, be joining us. So thank you to our presenters today, and thank you, Christina, for moderating. And um, if people do have questions um, and want to stick around, you're more than welcome to. Um, we could, I think, um, and also we'll share the slide deck. Um, we'll put that in the chat for folks. Um, if, if someone who has access to the slide deck can put that in the chat, that would be great. Um, would you, um, Maria, Christina, 